All right. Good morning, everyone. We are um, sorry for the link. Um, the link screw up, uh, but hopefully everybody's here who would like to be here. And um, we're recording this, so uh, if someone misses it, they could catch it later. But welcome to PMC's Gender and Sexuality Adult Education class. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, the aim of this class is to educate ourselves about gender and sexuality, dispel mis and misconceptions, and become better allies with our LGBTQ plus friends and family. This class will help us become more gender inclusive followers of Christ. Um, a little background on how we got to where we are today. Uh, this event is a dream of of LaVon Blowers, who was instrumental in putting this all together. Um, she has people backing her up, um, and they are myself, uh, Van Skerber, Sylvia Shirk, and Chris Bargu. So we are the team putting this on. Um, and just a note, if you have uh, comments or feedback, or um, wish to make a further conversation with any of us, we are all available at any time to do that. So um, I'd like to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, um, uh, so I'll just go ahead. Um, if Rachel, you will go to the next slide. So um, our hope is that you will ask questions um, as well as approach with curiosity, that you'll have an open mind and an open heart, um, that you'll be willing to welcome discomfort because that's what happens when we learn and unlearn, that you'll speak from your experience and tell your own story, that you'll remember that not everyone may know everything about the other people in the room or their family or their friends. Um, like everything else here at PMC, this is a non-judgment zone. And um, we are recording this session and the part that will be put on the website is, is just the presenter's presentation. So what I'm saying and what you'll be saying, uh, none of that will be put uh, out on our website. It will just be the presenter. And um, at the end of this four session class, we'll be doing a survey. So be thinking about um, thoughts that you might have about this class. Um, and if we were to do another one, um, some things you might like to see differently than what we're presenting now. And I'm wondering if anyone has any other questions or um, any thoughts about how this is going to be run? All right, I guess, I guess we covered it for now. So let's get started. Um, as you probably know, there are four weeks. The next four weeks will be meeting um, just like this in this hybrid, hybrid type session. Uh, the first session today is around gender expression. Uh, next Sundays will be uh, biological sex. The third Sunday will be gender identity. And the fourth Sunday will be sexual orientation. So for this week, we have a guest speaker. Her name is Rachel Weasley. She is the pastor and church planter of, at the Community of Hope, which is a new church community starting up in Bellingham, Washington. Their aim is centering queer theology and working for structural justice. So I am going to thank Rachel for being here this morning. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's good to visit Portland Mennonite. Um, let's see. Okay. I have never done a hybrid Google slide screen share before, but so far so good. Okay. Um, so 
just to kind of flesh out the intro a little more, um, I do identify as queer. Um, my partner is gender non-binary and transgender. Um, I live in Bellingham, Washington. We have a three-year-old named Zeke and a cat named Rutabaga. My church has existed for one year. So yay, we exist now. Um, and we are part of, we're officially part of um, the same conference with you. Um, so it's good to be sister churches. Um, and I think, I think that's uh, good enough on that front. Any of you are welcome to join us. Um, we're, we're an online church, and we meet on first Mondays of the month, once a month. Okay, so um, LaVon asked me to talk about this new flag um, that probably a lot of you have seen. So the, um, the rainbow flag, there's a lot of flags out there to represent different um, parts of the LGBTQ community. Um, there's the rainbow one, and then down here, oh, I forgot I have a laser pointer. Woo! Okay, here's the transgender flag. Um, this new flag has the transgender colors in it, and it also has a brown stripe and a black stripe. And that's because um, within the LGBTQ community, people of color experience um, gender and race are interconnected, and so is oppression. And so this is to uh, raise awareness of the um, unique um the unique challenges facing queer brown and black folks um and as we know jesus was all about the most marginalized parts of the population so it feels good to have this front and center on the new progress flag okay so um i've also been to asked to talk about pronouns in my screen my, my our like the, our little zoom photos are blocking part of the text is that true for you guys too no okay great so there's lots of different pronouns um i use she her hers um my partner uses they them their my child uses he him his but there are a lot of other different kinds of pronouns um so there's a cool graphic novel memoir called Gender Queer, and the author talks about coming to, um, like doing her own process of discernment, eventually deciding that E, M, ear are the pronouns that felt right for M. Then there's also Z, 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 which I think comes from German, I'm not sure. English doesn't have that much um, grammatical capacity for gender neutral pronouns, and so some have been adopted from other languages. Um, but the important thing to remember is that if somebody asks you to use a certain kind of pronouns for them, you should do it. And everybody gets to pick what their own, like how they want to be um, spoken, like how they want to be referred to. Um, a couple things about grammar. A person who wants to be using they, them pronouns, um, I know that it ends up sounding like you're using plural but grammatically, it's considered a singular them pronoun. Um, so you would say like, they don't want milk in their coffee, but, um, and you would say they are a person, but you wouldn't say they are two people. You know what I mean? Um, so that just sometimes people get a little confused by that. So I wanted to spot like that. There will be chances for Q&A later. And I wanted to talk about why it's a good idea to start gatherings by sharing pronouns. So in my church, um, when we do, you know, our coffee hour Zoom thingy, we share our name and then we also share our pronouns. Now, years ago when I first um, experienced this practice, I was like, this is so inefficient. Um, most of the people, when they go around, they say that they want the pronouns that I would have guessed anyway by just looking at them and their gender expression. So why do we have to waste this time? Um, but then when I went through my own journey of gender identity, I have had such a different experience of this practice. When I was reconsidering my own use of she, her pronouns, even though I've, I've always used she, her pronouns, I never didn't use she, her pronouns, but there was a period where I was really questioning this and praying about it and talking about it with friends and considering what it meant. And during this time, the spaces that started 
out by sharing pronouns felt like a space where my questions about my own identity were welcome. And it's really um, in our, because we have a power structure in our society that privileges straight and cisgendered folks, um, it's vulnerable sometimes to share traditional pronouns. And so if you start gatherings by sharing pronouns, it lowers the bar for the amount of like vulnerability and bravery that people need to do in order to ask for what they want um, and also to share about an important part of themselves. So, um, so there are also people that um, might want to use different pronouns on, on different days. Uh, maybe for a while they're sort of considering using a different pronoun and then they um, the, the experience of having, of hearing it be used um, can help in our discernment process. And so sometimes we'll return to a previous pronoun or move on to another pronoun. And um, the point is that it can change. And so that's why it's nice to start gatherings each time with pronouns and not assume that the pronoun somebody has asked you to use for them in the past is the one that they want you to use that day. Moreover, there are um, sometimes when people feel safe enough to use a pronoun in one space that they don't want to use in another space. And so um, if you are seeing somebody in different communities um, or like different gatherings, <laughs> ask you to use different pronouns in one space than the other, then that's just a good thing, to, a good way to show that you care about that person. Did I do all my bullet points? Um, okay, I'm going to talk about this later too, but Gender is, it seems, I think the way most of us were raised is it seems like it's a part of us, like, you know, I have a nose and I was born with a gender, but it's not. It's not fixed and it's not essential. It's changeable and it's cultural. Um, and so, yeah, it can change and it means different things to different people in different parts of the world, um, in different generations, all kinds of things like that can affect gender. Uh, do, do, do. If you start gatherings with pronouns, it's a signal that this group does not need you to stay in your gender, your previous gender performance in order for you to be welcome. Okay, I think I've, I think I've pretty much covered this slide. Parts of my slide are covered by all the Zoom thingies, so that's why I'm having trouble here. Okay. So this is left over from the PowerPoint slides that I was given originally. And I kept it in because I think it's a cool way of um, gesturing again to the reason it's important to talk about gender in a church space, which is because of power structures in our society. Um, so Madonna is singing about how girls can wear jeans and cut their hair short, wear shirts and boots because it's okay to be a boy. But for a boy to look like a girl is degrading because you think that being a girl is degrading. So, um, I mean, I guess this seems kind of self-explanatory to me, but, um, and forgive me because I've been awake for kind of, <laughs> kind of a while. I already preached and led music and everything at another church early this morning. So, um, so thank you for your grace. Um, in a society that is patriarchal, and values the male over the female, then um, when th then when I wear um, things that are considered masculine, I'm um, usually in less danger of violence or um, microaggressions than if somebody is um, adopting feminine traits that um, that they wouldn't usually use because the feminine in our current power structure of hierarchy is like below the masculine. I feel like I said that really poorly, but um, the point is um, girls are allowed to wear pants in a way that men are not allowed to wear skirts. And that's because of hierarchy and it's because of sexism and it's not because of something essential about reality. Okay, this is an old fashioned way to talk about gender. It is linear, which is a very common um, way to think in our binary thinking Western society. Um, it comes from Plato and ancient Greece. Over here we have women, over there we have men. 
they're diametrically opposed. Um, this is not the way I experience my gender identity, my um, gender expression. But it is a very common way of thinking and it's kind of hard to break out of it sometimes. So we need new images. So I have this kaleidoscope here which is a non-linear way of imagining gender. But now let's go back and look at this one though. Okay, the gender unicorn. This is a um, different way to talk about gender that was actually created by um, a gender queer person. So here we have, um, all of us have a gender identity. You could have, um, you could identify in a certain amount of femaleness, maleness, and another gender because like we said gender is cultural and so anytime we imagine a gender then that's how that's the only way gender exists by us imagining it and talking about it with each other um so uh gender identity is how we identify inside of ourselves so um gender expression is what we show to others um our gender ex expression can change different times like um Maybe sometimes I want to look more masculine or more feminine, um, but that doesn't mean like it's kind of like on Halloween, the costume you put on doesn't change how you think about yourself on the inside, um, but it can help. So if I have a gender identity that I'm trying to lean more into, then expressing it through clothes or behavior and stuff um, can help me understand myself better and lean into that identity. So these are related, but they're different from each other. Meanwhile, we have the sex assigned at birth, um, which, you know, is, and then there's also your actual body parts. Um, you guys are going to get into that next week. Um, physical attraction and emotional attraction are different. This is who I want to date and marry, and this is who I'm attracted to. So those two things can be different. There's the gender unicorn. So let me just pause here and you guys can kind of like um, look at this and consider how much of each of these arrows feels like home to you. Like some of you might only identify with one arrow or some of you might have a mix. So let me just give you a minute to think about that and then I'll move on. So just like our world is always changing and we are always changing, our gender is always changing. And I have a quote here from Kate Borenstein, who is my favorite, and I love her. And I accidentally closed the window, so give me a second here. Okay, um, so Kate Bornstein, it, she's several decades older than I am, and she's a trans woman, and she's on Twitter. I have a whole slide just announcing that she's on Twitter because she's so awesome, and that way you can all read everything she says. Okay, so she, um, she says, so hey, you've got more than one gender. How about them apples? I'm not saying this to invisibilize the transgender, transsexual, or any other trans experience. I'm saying that gender transition, like everything else, is a matter of degree, and there's a tipping point when gender transition is claimed as transgender. That tipping point is different for everyone, and so we've got an unlimited number of genders walking around in the world right now. Imagine if all those people were doing their gender mindfully. What would the world look like then? And then she goes on, whether, that ident whether our identity has felt more or less right or wrong to us, it's the one we've been living through for so quite some time now. So transitioning out of it into something completely different can take years. Please keep this in mind. There is no rush. With every moment, we're changing. Enjoy that change. That's a good way to learn patience. And your patience will be rewarded because the more deeply you explore each step of your journey, the fewer times you'll need to retrace any steps. That's been my experience. 
Um, I, we're going to end, you know, at the end of our time together today with a song that takes its lyrics from the Gospel of Thomas. And the words of the whole passage in Gospel of Thomas are, If you are seeking, you must not stop until you find. When you find, however, you will become troubled. Your confusion will give way to wonder. In wonder, you will reign over all things. Your sovereignty will be your rest. And I do, um, in my own spiritual life, I do notice God pointing to ambiguity as a value. In creation, we see that God did create land and water, but also there's in-between spaces like bogs and swamps. And there's um, night and day, but there's also dawn and twilight. And I think in our binary way of thinking that we inherited from thinkers like Plato, uh, we, we don't always notice all the in-betweens that make up our beautiful world of diversity, and we skip just to two binaries. And that's just not, in my opinion, the most accurate way to view the world. Um, so just as Lois told us that learning involves discomfort, I encourage us to remember that discomfort can be holy and it can be a space where God is working in you. Um, and that ambiguity and lack of clarity um, can actually be a value. They can be um, an advantage and they can be helpful to us. Okay, Kate Bornstein is on Twitter. Also, she's written books. I recommend her. Enjoy. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my own, some, some examples of my own gender expression. And I'm going to try to go quickly because, um, so that we have time for everything. So, I did go through a phase when I was not out about being queer. And in this phase, I avoided high heels, I would not be caught dead wearing ruffles, and I avoided pink. Um, then, um, let's see. This next, so so those those were ways that I didn't realize that I was expressing my gender in a slightly gender queer way. I was um, making choices about what kind of femininity I wanted to express, but I wasn't aware of what I was doing, which is, I mean, that's fine. Um, so then I, um, my partner who I'm married to, got a job as a pastor, and so I went to their pastoral installation service. Now, my mom is pastor's wife, was a pastor's wife, and my grandma was a pastor's wife, and I did not want to be a pastor's wife, and I didn't want the congregation to see me as a pastor's wife. So um, that was one of the first times I remember co intentionally considering what clothes to put on so that I could um, fine tune my gender expression. So I thought to myself, what would a quote unquote pastor's wife look like so that I could avoid that costume, you know? Um, so I, the, um, the image I got was like of the first lady, you know, like a, a skirt suit or like the queen of England, you know, like pearls, like a respectable, right? So I, so I was like, okay, no respectable dresses. <laughs> that was my like first starting point. And then I think I ended up wearing like, um, boots with leggings and like, um, a skirt that I got in Chicago. And you know, in Chicago, things are more formal than in the Pacific Northwest. And so it was like a different, uh, and you know, gender is done differently in different places too. And so it was like a way to like dodge some of the, um, some of the expectations that I wanted people to not have of me um, and what my role was gonna be in the church. Okay, then when I was pregnant, this was, an, this was another time that I remember actually like thinking, huh, I think I'm doing gender expression. So when I was pregnant, I had terrible pregnancy induced anxiety. And so I didn't like people to like look at me or take photos of me or stuff like that. But I was a barista in a cafe. So people were always gonna look at me. But I developed a practice of dressing like what I thought people would think of as a pregnant woman. So that way the true me on the inside would be safe and hidden. And I could just feel like I was like kind of putting on like a shell that kind of made me invisible because people would see what they expected to see and the real me would be inside. And I remember kind of pondering this like, huh, it feels like I'm putting on a costume, but it feels like a costume that makes me feel safe. But it doesn't feel like the inner me is on the outside and yet I'm comfortable with it. So I just want to put that out there. I'm not sure if any of you identify with that. 
Okay, um, then I did a family wedding and I did not, I, I, sorry, this was after I had a kid. I was totally considering my gender identity. I wasn't sure what kind of woman I wanted to be. I was trying to kind of like look more butch in general and stuff. I was, um, I was on a journey. And so I got a bow tie and like a button up um, shirt that went all the way up because you know, um, a lot of times when women wear button up shirts, you leave like the top button open, but I like did the top button and put a bow tie and wore like one of those jackets that has the um, elbow pads. But I did wear flat like female shoes or whatever. Like I went to the women's section of the shoe store and got like flat formal shoes. So that was my like compromise. Like I didn't want to stick out too much, but I also didn't want to, I kind of wanted to confuse people a little bit so that I would feel more comfortable and less like my, um, like my self was getting um, kind of diluted into like the wash of the kind of cultural norms. Okay, then I had a baby, I was breastfeeding, um, I didn't fit into any of the clothes that I had worn before he was born. And I, so I bought new clothes that are designed for breastfeeding. And these were like very middle of the road clothes. They didn't have much pizzazz. They didn't have like my favorite band on it or anything like that. These were clothes that are just designed for like lowest common denominator of like person who is breastfeeding. And so they were like feminine in a way that did not feel comfortable for me. So to compensate, I got a different haircut and it was a lot more, um, it was different from my current haircut, but my current haircut actually is a lot like the haircut my dad had when he was in college. So, you know, I think, um, carrying around a baby was like, it was like I was putting on this very feminine accessory every morning. And so to compensate, I got like a more like masculine haircut. I mean, sorry, haircut. And then that made me feel more comfortable about my like overall balance of gender performance. So as I came more into my own with my gender expression, I realized that now I felt comfortable drinking chocolate martinis because in the past, dressing so feminine, I compensated by like drinking whiskey neat and like carrying heavy clothes and talking about science fiction and stuff, which I do love. Um, but once I was more intentional about the other ways I was expressing gender, I was able to drink a drink I actually like. I like chocolate martinis. And so being more intentional about my gender expression has allowed me to enjoy other things because I'm not trying to like compensate so much in a way that keeps me from drinking a drink I enjoy, you know? Um, I, and then finally, I almost didn't buy this shirt because it has these wrinkle puff thingies, but I put it on in the store and I liked it. And I was like, Rachel, you get to wear stuff you like, you know? And so I just encourage us all to think about the rules that we've given ourselves, like no pink, no ruffles, no heels, um, and kind of like live into our joy more with our gender expression. And I know that that can be really tricky um, in a world that's that's patriarchal and full of hierarchy. Okay, so um, here we have a baby in a blue blanket, but we do not know the gender of this baby. Same thing here. This is a baby wearing pink that does not tell us anything about how the baby identifies. And then these are some examples of gender queer baby sweaters that I knitted where I was trying to experiment like way back in this linear picture of gender, gender expression has feminine and masculine in the middle as androgynous. And that's just really not the only option. You can have actively masculine and actively feminine expressions in the same outfit, in the same person. So this was my way of saying like, okay, how can you have um, actively feminine and actively masculine markers in the same garment. And my um, goal with this knitting project was like to confuse people. Like, cause I don't see why we should be pigeonholing babies into gender binaries that they haven't even 
been able to, they don't, they don't even understand English yet. They don't understand the cultural concept of gender we have in our particular society. Okay, and then these are left over from whoever made these slides originally, but in some cultures, a skirt is considered something a man wears. Um, and then meanwhile, we have a woman indoors. Um, here's the button up shirt open at the top, like what I said before. Here it is buttoned all the way up with a tie. Outdoors, um, the facial expression is part of gender expression. Even the posture, like see how she kind of has her arms in. Um, and that's something women do sometimes is like kind of make themselves smaller. But even like black men will sometimes want to make themselves smaller if they're very big because they're trying to avoid violence against them by people that um, have stereotypes about um, gender and race and the way those interact. Okay, then meanwhile, this is a prince. Um, I can't access my notes about this. This is also left over from the previous presenter. This is a boy. I can't remember how many hundreds of years ago or whatever, but this is like a royal prince. And back then, um, pink was considered a boy color. I guess we don't technically know how that kiddo identified, but in history, he's recorded as a boy. Okay, my godmother is much older than me, and she is always learning. And one time she referred to my partner as my husband, and I said, we don't use husband, we use partner language. And she said, oh, okay, thanks for telling me. And that's, and then she just used partner after that. And it just wasn't a big deal. And I just love her for that. And so I want to give this as an invitation. Not only are Kate Bornstein and my grandmother, people in an older generation who are still learning all the time, but nobody's perfect. And I think bringing your best heart and your best efforts to things and being willing to learn, like if you are doing positive self-talk, it will help you respond well when somebody needs to correct you. All of us are doing gender expression. How is God calling you to express your gender? Okay, so I'll, let me do a time change, time check. It's 10, 12. So Lois, do you want to do 10 or 15 minutes of reflection questions so we can close in prayer and song? Perfect. Okay, so I have three slides of reflection questions. And what I recommend because of this hybrid environment is that um, take a couple minutes right now and just journal. Um, if you have burning questions on your heart, feel free to ignore these and journal about that other stuff. But in case you're kind of like at a loss, here are some things to get you started. And then um, we'll journal a little bit. Then in case people are extroverts and need to say stuff, we'll have a time for people to share about what they reflected on. And then we'll move on to the next set of questions and then we'll have a time to share. So it'll be, it'll be kind of quick, but we'll go back and forth. So I'm gonna mute it right now. And I, enjoy, I invite you to um, invite the Holy Spirit into your reflection for the next couple minutes here. And I'll bring you back to share when it's time.